Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Don't Risk It podcast presented by VFIS Client Risk Solutions. This program focuses on the exposures our clients frequently encounter and discusses some potential solutions to help reduce these exposures. I'm your host, Chris Rogers, with VFIS Client Risk Solutions, and today we're talking with Mike Baker and Brian DeQuinn from the Client Risk Solutions team. They're here to discuss the height and weight of emergency vehicles and why obtaining that information is important to your organization. Guys, I want to thank you both for joining me again, and it's always a pleasure to have you both on the program. Thanks for having me, Chris. Thank you, Chris. So why is obtaining the heights and weights of your emergency vehicles such an important step to take? Chris, there's a bunch of reasons why. I mean, when you look at it, it's knowing what type of restrictions you may have within your first due, knowing if your vehicle is going to fit in your station, uh, you know, from the EMS perspective, going to that nursing home or that hospital, making sure that you know you can fit. Um, and it's really part of the vehicle maintenance process, making sure that, you know, we're not exceeding our gross vehicle axle weight ratings uh, and things like that. So really, there's a whole bunch of reasons why we should do it. And and I'll add to that. And, and everything Brian said is absolutely correct. And the main reason we're doing this is the liability exposure that you have if that vehicle is overweight. So departments, they have a multitude of vehicles that make up their fleet. Um, are we talking about just a large apparatus or does that include, uh, you know, the uh, SUVs, cars, things like that? Uh, what vehicles should we be atta- obtaining the heights and weights on? Chris, yeah, everybody seems to focus on the large apparatus and so forth. Everything, you know, 26,000 and above. Um, those are the ones you really want to, you know, obviously for obvious reasons, put your, your eyes on and, and get the weights on those. Some of the things that departments miss are some of the the brush or grass vehicles where they have skid units, um, as well as uh, the ones that I always see. Um, we, we've been to so many places where they have trailers. Trailers are used in a fire service for a number of different things. Um, you know, I've been at organizations where they have a collapse team and all their equipment in a trailer, and that trailer is rated for seven thousand or ten thousand. And you know, they've got plywood sheets in there stacked up, you know, three feet deep with struts and everything else. That really quickly adds up and can exceed the capacity of that vehicle, not only the trailer itself, but what you're towing it with in that combo set. Well, and Mike, even to add, you know, some of your command vehicles or chase vehicles, we start putting those heavy command consoles in or your your shelving units for your med bags. We should still know what the weight is of those vehicles. I mean, that, those shelving units can be extremely heavy depending on what they're made out of. So um, what about a converted or modified vehicles? You know, if, if a department uh, is a volunteer agency and they've had uh, a vehicle loaned to them and they've converted it to a brush truck or some type of other vehicle that it wasn't necessarily designed for, um, are those um, integrated into this uh, suggestion as well? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of departments will get government issued vehicles, uh, you know, ex-military surplus vehicles. Uh, we see some things, too, with um, the Oshkosh, air, you know, the airport vehicles where departments want to convert them and use them for various purposes in their in their region. So, yeah, it, it does not only pertain to the manufactured uh, purpose, you know, fire service uh, vehicle, but it also goes outside of that to some of these things that uh, departments can pick up on surplus or cheap cost and, and do a lot of the work themselves in-house in order to reduce the overall uh, purchase price of that vehicle. Yeah, I know military surplus units are, are popular in Texas for uh, um, brush vehicles and also high water rescue vehicles. Uh, a lot of times they put a skid on them. Those things are probably, they're, they're deuce and a half and five tons, so they're probably not at risk of being overweight, but you don't want to live in that gray area. You'll probably want to find out. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, Chris, I think I was with you that time. We, we saw it was a rollback truck that had a, uh, a a giant bulldozer on it for, for again, for wildfire, grass fire purposes. But it was clearly that vehicle was overweight. Correct, yes. So once that we went out and we've obtained the heights and weights, um, you know, where should they be located? So it should be in two places. It should be readily available for the driver to see, but it should also be readily available for the officer to see. Part of uh, looking at double checking each other or the officer taking some ownership in it as well is making sure that we aren't putting that vehicle somewhere that we're not supposed to. So part of a good safety culture is really instilling that concept for both the driver and the officer. Yeah. You know, that, that officer, you're right, Brian, how many times do we go to departments where they have culvert pipes or private bridges that may not even be rated 
Um, you know, we'll take this question a step further is you, you really should do some pre-planning in your first due or even in your second due response areas to understand where those hazards lie because um, you don't necessarily want to be taking a, a, a 3,500-gallon tanker over a, a steel culvert pipe that's only buried eight inches below the driveway. Um, you're just going to end up with a rollover situation in that driveway against low speed, but um, nevertheless, that vehicle is going to go over. Well, and Mike, it, it goes back to accountability. You know, we're seeing it more and more in the industry. How many of our vehicle manufacturers are starting to put speedometers on the officer side for that exact reason is making sure that there's a second level of accountability to help protect us from a liability standpoint. So does the height and weight uh, on the vehicle placard and the door frame, does that count uh, for what we're looking for? So the, the placard is really going to be a representation by the manufacturer, what the, the capability is of that vehicle. Um, the way when you weigh your vehicle, the number that you get may be or hopefully will be under that number, but it may be over that number. And, and you should be aware of the actual the vehicle weight that you have. And when we talk about that, let's also consider, I think, Brian, is there other things we should consider in that? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, obviously all the equipment in there, but also the personnel. So, you know, you're going to have different people in that vehicle. You're going to have two, four, six, eight, um, you know, depends on how big of an apparatus it is. So you should absolutely have those figures, uh, whether it's real numbers or guesstimations included in that weight so that we are truly accounting for the entire gross vehicle weight. And really we want to be under what that permissible number is by the manufacturer. If we're over, we have a problem. The other thing that, that we recommend is actually weighing the vehicle by axle as well as side to side. So it's not just pulling the entire vehicle on a scale and, and seeing if we fall under that GVW, but we also want to weigh that front to rear to make sure those axle capacities are not being exceeded, as well as side to side to make sure that we're not overloading one side of that vehicle compared to another, which would in turn prevent or present a, a rollover hazard. So is this a, a once and done procedure or, or is this something that we need to uh, take a look at, um, you know, periodically? Uh, you know, how often should we reevaluate the weights of the vehicles? Chris, that's a good question because a lot of organizations believe that it is a once and done and it is not. It should be done at least annually. Uh, the other thing is anytime you do any type of large equipment moving, you should absolutely be getting that vehicle weight again. Again, it's it's a level of protection for the organization. Uh, and it, it's to help reduce liabilities. It's to help produce or reduce the risk of rollovers. So it's the organization taking it to the next step to do proper risk management of their organization. And that's really what this comes down to is how do we manage our risks appropriately? And, and Chris, I encourage those vehicles, uh, those weight slips that come off those vehicles, the dated weight slips, that they be placed into the maintenance files for each of those vehicles. Absolutely. It's an important for, place for it. So are there any resources that, that VFIS has that uh, offers suggestions that you mentioned on frequency of, of, uh, of having your vehicles weighed or, or just suggested best practices in that area? We do. We have some communiques on it. There's some uh, stuff on our VFIS.com. Uh, there's also some stuff on uh, responder help related to that as well, talking about the gross vehicle weight, axle weight ratings. Perfect. So we'll be sure to include any of those resources, uh, physical resources that we have as a link um, in the description of this podcast. And uh, but as I mentioned, you can also find more information on VFIS.com and, uh, and RespondedHelp.com. Gentlemen, I want to thank you for joining me today. It's always a pleasure to have you both on. And uh, thanks again for all this great information. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. It's a pleasure as always. And I want to thank you for listening to the program and for your interest in VFIS safety resources. I want to thank our guests, Mike Baker and Brian DeQuinn, once again, for their time and information. Please consider subscribing to our program to stay up to date on new content releases. Also, if you like what you've heard, please consider leaving a review below. For more information about the many resources available from VFIS, please visit VFIS.com. And to submit ideas for future discussions, please reach out by email and VFIS Risk Control at VFIS.com. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day. The views, information, or opinions expressed during this program are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of Gladfelter Insurance Group, VFIS, and its employees.